Hi there. In this lecture, we see Emmanuel Lasker against Harry Nelson Pillsbury. So this is an iconic first encounter between the two. So 1893, New York tournament, round eight. E4 from Lasker. We have E5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, and Pillsbury chooses a fianchetto here. Spins love defense. And now Lasker doubles the pawns voluntarily. Technically better seems c3 just to uh, construct the center here. This should give white an, an edge in most variations. And uh, yeah, it should be fine. Even if white loses that light square bishop, there's other compensating factors here with that pawn duo in the center. But anyway, bishop takes c6, d takes c6, we have d3, bishop g7, knight c3, bishop e6, bishop e3. Queen e7, queen e2, c5. So here we now have h3, c6, a4, b6, knight d2, knight f6, f3, knight d7, white castles, and now g5, trying to stop f4 from white, but weakening the light squares a little bit, these light squares. We have knight d1, h6, c3, and black castles, knight f2, rook fd8, rook fd1, knight f8. So black has the bishop pair, but has structural damage. There are interesting trade-offs in this position. We have a5, knight g6, a takes, a takes, queen f1, knight f4. Now with the queen on f1, it is possible to try and evict the knight, as well as the knight here, protecting d3 and h3 so the knight can be kicked at some point soon we have a pair of rooks coming off rook a1 queen b7 queen b1 rook a6 king h2 bishop f8 g3 so the knight is repelled back king g2 queen a7 so we're pressure on the a file we have the rooks coming off the board knight f1 Bishop b6, c4. So there is a lock on black's double pawns, kind of Nimzovician blockade against the double pawns. The bishop isn't entirely good on d6. So it's an interesting situation. And black has a tempting plan here to try and play for this kind of thing to weaken f4 for a knight. We have f6, the start of that plan, bishop d2, and now h5. So an interesting plan in action. Knight e3, h4. Is it double-edged, this plan? Does it weaken the king as well as light squares? We have knight fg4. And now bishop takes g4. Here, h takes g is interesting. On knight takes f6 check and the knight returning, this situation should be okay for white. It's a small edge there. White should be fine there. Okay, so h takes g3 is interesting, but it doesn't do too much. So bishop takes g4 now, gives up the knight square bishop. h takes g, and now knight f5. So ready to be able to take a knight on f4 if they did at some point. But hitting the uh, bishop right now, we have bishop f8. King takes g3. If you might have asked, what about knight f4 here? Yeah, this is the point. Bishop takes f4 and then, then knight takes d6. So bishop f8 and now king takes g3. Otherwise, that's going to be very unpleasant, knight f4, because it's going to protect g3. g3 is taken out. Queen a7, queen f1, queen d7. Queen b1, knight e7. Bishop e3. So it seems white's a little bit passive for that backward pawn on d3. We have knight takes f5 check. Now a very interesting kind of decision here. Which way to take the knight, e takes or g takes? What way would you play if you want to pause the video here for 20 points? What are the key considerations? Okay. Now Nesca took on e takes f5. This keeps a pawn on g4 
which is a hook on h5. Think about this hook. This is useful sometimes in uh, the variations we're about to see. The other way has its perk, of course, that it locks down the e5 pawn. There's no theoretical e5, e4. Uh, and you know this one doesn't seem a big deal but um so it's got that perk of keeping a potentially attacking support pawn basically the g4 pawn uh just to demonstrate concretely actually g takes you know this position should be you know it, it should be about you know equal it should be stable and if queen if bishop d6 again you know it it, it should be stable Okay, let's look at the main game here with the pawn on g4. So queen h7. And, you know, black also has got a hook on h4. The king steps away. And there's a bit of cat and mouse going on here because you know, this looks quite committal, but there's, there's also bishop f2 and, and maybe the a file infiltration. So the queen wants to stick around and look at d3. And to relieve the queen of this duty of d3, the king comes to e2 so king f2 king e2 so the queen doesn't have to nanny the d3 pawn we have bishop d6 bishop d2 queen a4 and here we see queen h1 and, and it looks very dangerous if white is allowed this so queen a7 bishop e3 we have here a mistake it's actually a big mistake here uh, black should have been quite careful in this position and perhaps just swung the queen over for example queen h7 just challenge that a file instead king g7 is played and now there's a chance to create very interesting dynamic imbalance of material <laughs> but whether that imbalance of material definitely 100% wins in every single variation is uh, it, it's not entirely clear cut. But how does white actually create a very interesting material imbalance in the first place here? What move would you play if you really you know wanted to spice things up here? Basically, add add a lot of spice to the position. How would you do that here for 100 points? Okay, quite late on, just queen and bishop each, but we have the bishop being sacrificed. Bishop takes g5. This has the effect of undermining black's pawn chain. So f takes, and the key point here, can you see the key point here? Yeah, f6 check. And this is where this g4 pawn now is actually handy with this f6 check. King g8 is played. If king takes f6, white ends up winning the queen like this. With the, the queen's exposed there on a7 as an unprotected piece. And the other thing is king g6, our friendly pawn on g4, assists the queen for that little nudge check. That little nudge, which is an absolutely crushing to win the queen. Again on a7. You can see the importance of the g4 pawn there. Fun stuff. So we have king g8. Is this categorically winning now? Queen h6. So another pawn is picked up. So there does seem to be a lot of compensation in the worst case scenario. And maybe this is like, you know, an influence on Mikhail Tal. In the worst case scenario here, it's a lot of compensation already. And this is actually technically a mistake, King h8. The two pawns are very dangerous. And, you know, Black's going to have. Not, you know, with that bishop, that imprisoned bishop at the moment, he's not going to have a great time trying to win this. But with king h8, it helps white, it seems. King f8, here's a scenario where the pawns versus the bishop, the bishop can at least try and secure a draw. You know, for example, like this, it goes into a drawn king and pawn ending as, as a theoretical example. So that's with king f8. But now we have, you know, king h8. This leaves the king in a vulnerable place, relatively vulnerable place. Even though it seems kind of logical about the pawns, we see queen f5, bishop f8, and here there is actually a definite way for white to gain the advantage against any opponent, any resistance, any level of accuracy. 
So there's a slight inaccuracy from, from Lasker in playing G5, it seems. There is actually a killer move in this position. Can, can you guess what that is? Which would work against absolutely any defence, it seems. It seems objectively the position is won with King E3. The position is actually objectively a winning position. Because b5, b3, this situation, let's say this situation, king e4. The king is actually a great fighting piece in this particular situation. The king's not exposed to be checkmate, it seems. And we have like this major infiltration, which seems completely outrageous. And quite often, you know, this kind of thing is fraught with danger, of course. But here, you know, picking off the pawns, White is uh, using the king very, very aggressively. This is a great example where the king can be used aggressively. And it's just a winning position for White. For example, like this. White's picked up enough pawns. The queen is condemned to the fence because of that pawn on f6. The king holds f6 here. White's winning this. It's, it's, it's pretty hopeless. So... Um, yeah, but g5 was played, and there is a glimmer of defensive hope here. Queen h5, queen takes e5. It's slightly different, but b5 blunders this position away. King g8 needed to be played here, it seems. So queen f8, and just go back here. As soon as the queen is x-raying the king, the king should move out of the x-ray. And there sh it should be even. But with b5, keeping that x-ray against the king, this is in white's favour. And White now plays this move, King E3, and you know, so it's played here, and this is very, very effective. If F7 had been played, check, King H7, check. This is just perpetual check, this scenario. But with King E3, it's almost as if Black's in a almost a, you know a Zugzwang situation, where you know the compulsion to move creates a downside. And we do see that. Queen h4. The queen is a bit looser and more exploitable on h4. However, the alternatives aren't brilliant here. If queen h1, check, 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 g6, check, g7, check. And the black king is getting in, in big trouble. Or if king h4, queen g4, friendly pawn there, mate. And... If B takes C4, then this situation is also pretty miserable for black. So this situation, white can maneuver and get this kind of attack going. And it gets to be crushing. You know, the pawns are quite crushing. As an example, yeah, the two pawns are just going to be winning there so it is a kind of uh it, it is a kind of zugzwang so queen h4 is played and here we have f7 check king h7 and guess what is the move that ends the game here for 100 points white play and end game a crushing blow okay you might want to pause the video can you spot the idea yeah it's cruel. I mean, it's queen f5 check. Black has to resign because king h8 or g7, it doesn't matter. There's still queen f6 check. And the king's put here, but now the queen is x-raying this queen. And that's helpful for g6 check to make that x-ray into an exploitable win of, a, win of the queen. Winning the queen. Crushing in the end, but a very fascinating you know, peace sacrifice, just when you think, you know, there, there isn't much material to justify such a peace sacrifice well into the game. But yeah, these pawns are quite aggressive hooks and they are very handy. At minimum, you know, there's potentially a very dangerous potential of two connected past pawns. So it seems a fairly risk-free switch of the position to something more complicated and difficult, much more difficult for Pillsbury to defend. And Pillsbury is someone who develops, you know, huge calculating ability and brilliant visualization. So, you know, he had trouble defending this peace sacrifice. Bishop takes g5. It is looking more dangerous for black to play accurately than for white. So the onus of accuracy 
is passed to the opponent with this move. So if there's a situation, maybe this is the, the takeaway point, where both sides are equal, but it's easy for both sides, relatively easy for both sides to play the cat and mouse game. If you can have an option to turn that into a position which is still equal, you can't lose it basically, but there is a gr much greater potential for the opponent to make a mistake. Switching to that position, that's what happened here. Black was forced into a situation of, of having to play extremely accurately. And even though white wasn't extremely accurate, it seems, it was still overall black's level of accuracy needed to be higher. The relative accuracy of black needed to be higher after this. Bishop takes g5. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating game. Epic encounter between the two. Hope you enjoyed that. Thanks very much.